Hello and welcome back to the unofficial Gilded Age After Show. I am Kelsey Paul, Manager of Interpretation and Engagement at the Frick Pittsburgh. Uh, we are back for another episode, episode five of the After Show, to talk about episode five of the Gilded Age. Charity has two functions. Um, we have a couple of familiar faces with us and a new face with us today. Um, we are joined again by Elizabeth Barker, who is the Executive Director of the Frick Pittsburgh. Uh, Melanie Groves is back with us. She is our manager of exhibitions and registrar. And we have a special guest this week, Trudy Cox, who is the CEO and executive director of the uh, Preservation Society of Newport. And we are so excited to have Trudy here with us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I am so, delighted to be with you. Yes, we are going to talk all about Newport because Newport has such an important role sort of in the show. Um, obviously, we've heard about Newport a little bit. We've seen just a little bit of Newport um, in the show in episode one, but you are also really a principal filming location for the show. Um, for those of you, you know, who are watching who aren't super familiar with the Newport mansions, um, you're not just one historic site. You are a collection of many historic homes in Newport County, several of which, six of which, I guess, are filming locations for the Gilded Age, which is really exciting. So we're going to talk all about that. Um, I do always like to start with an episode synopsis. Um, so in episode five of the Gilded Age, we see Bertha, Marion, Aurora, and Peggy make an overnight trip to see Clara Barton speak. And then we see Gladys's desire, desired beau is invited to dinner. And we see all of the fallout of that. And we're going to talk about both of those things. But let's, let's start with Newport, um, because it is such an important thing. Um, like I said, Newport is both a very real place in the world of the Gilded Age, but it's also a filming location. Before we get to sort of the behind the scene things, um, Trudy, could you tell viewers a little bit for those who are sort of unfamiliar, what is the significance of Newport in the Gilded Age and sort of how does it become such a important center of high society at that time? That is an excellent question. And thank you so much, Kelsey and Lizzie and Melanie for inviting me to be with you today. Um, Newport has been a destination for really centuries. It is a place that Southerners escaped to in the 1800s, early 1800s, and it has always held prominence as a place to get away to. And I think it's because the summer climate is absolutely perfect. You've got a wonderful sea breeze uh, from Narragansett Bay in the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, and it is a very beautiful place. So it is not unusual that people like the Russells and others that we're seeing on the Gilded Age would at some point in their ascension uh, into higher society would consider or not consider coming to Newport and building a house, a house similar to the house behind me, which is the Breakers. And it was one of the sites uh, for the TV series itself. So Newport has been a destination uh, for high society for many, many years. And uh, it is the thing that you did in order to make your name and let the world know that you had come into money or had made money. And so as a result, we are the beneficiaries in that uh, many of our houses are Gilded Age mansions built by Vanderbilts and others. Um, and people today get the chance to see life just as, as it was in the 1880s, 1890s. And I think we're all blessed by that. Newport has, um, architecturally, is a really interesting place. It has a huge collection, largest collection in the country of colonial buildings, but it also has a large collection of Victorian and Gilded Age mansions. So if somebody wants to learn about American architecture, in a few days, come and walk the streets of Newport and visit the houses of the Newport mansions and houses of other organizations. And you will really have an immersion into American architecture. That's amazing. And yeah, I mean, I've been spending some time on, on your guys' website. You have wonderful virtual tours as well, which is really exciting. You can see some of the houses. Um, I'd recommend anyone who is interested in checking that out. Um, but tell us a little bit, and you've told us a little bit already, but tell us a little bit about what the experience of filming a show like The Gilded Age was like for you all. Um, and also a little bit about what it was like to get some time with Julian Fellows and what that whole experience was like. That's fascinating. 
Well, we were very fortunate that uh, Julian Fellows, I believe, was one of the key uh, players in designating Newport as a site for filming. He had a real passion for Newport even before he came. He admitted to us that one of his favorite houses is Marble House and that he loves the dining room, the gold room, excuse me, the ballroom, the gold room. Um, and so uh, we, we were able to show many of the houses to the producers of this TV show, the HBO people. And um, fortunately, a, a number of the rooms were selected. Now, this is different from Downton Abbey because <laughs> in this particular case, rooms in Newport are being transformed into rooms in New York. And we hope as the show progresses that more activity will occur in Newport. We don't know yet because we haven't been given the full story. Um, but many of the rooms that people are seeing right now in New York are rooms that come from Newport. So it's a little confusing. And there yeah, are I mean, times go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> when we, we, there are times when we ourselves look at a room and say, is, is that ours or is that the set? Um, because Bob Shaw, who is the set designer and is an incredible artist and really understands Gilded Age architecture and decorative elements, has really done a phenomenal job in recreating a set that really could be one of our houses. And so uh, there's confusion at times as we watch the TV series. <laughs> Makes it more like a little bit of an Easter egg situation where you're trying to spot the spot the actual. Exactly. Um, so we, I want to go through a little bit of some of the um, the scenes or the the sets that that viewers would learn would be maybe interested to learn are actually inspired by Newport or actually you know are your actual physical houses. Right. Um, so the Breakers is of course a. Uh, very prominent uh, filming location. Most notably, um, the Breakers Music Room is the Russell Ballroom. Um, so viewers would recognize that from a couple of scenes we've seen. The gorgeous billiards room. There's that scene with uh, George Russell playing billiards with uh, Mr. Morris, I, I guess. Uh, so that's that's the Breakers. Um, Marble House, um, we've seen a little bit of is Consuelo Vanderbilt's bedroom. It's a beautiful red bedroom, um, serves as George Russell's bedroom. Um, but then one of the older homes, Hunter House, is actually Tom Rakes's first office, that first office that we see in, in the first episode with Marion. Um, we've seen a little bit of Chateau sur Mer. Uh, the, there's a bedroom that serves as Mr. Morris's bedroom. Um, and then the kitchen. I want to talk about a little bit about the Elms kitchen, um, because that is the Russell kitchen, which we see actually quite a bit of in episode five. There's lots of fun gossip among the staff in episode five <laughs> and they're always sitting in that beautiful kitchen i wondered from the get-go because that kitchen is so striking i wondered if that was a set but it's a real kitchen it's your guys's kitchen one of them <laughs> yeah it is and that's where they spent a lot of their time they were here as i mentioned when we were gathering together earlier um they were here for five to seven weeks and it was in the middle of 2020, February through the spring. So the timing couldn't have been more complicated because of COVID, but also from a financial perspective for Newport, it was really important because there was some life, there was activity going on. And they brought a number, hundreds of people into town and all of the services that were required were um, brought in by uh, local merchants, which was very important for the economy here. So they spent a lot of time in the kitchen and actually changed very little, um, except that I, th I think it was interesting that their film schedule lasted until 11 and 12 at night. So in order to give the feeling that it was a daytime situation, they would stream in huge lights through the windows of the kitchen to make sure that the audience wasn't confused. It wasn't night, it was day. So they, they're they very good at uh, doing tricks, I think, that yeah. none of us would realize when we're watching a show. Yeah, 
And we, you know, we talked with Howard Zarr from Lindhurst. He shared a little bit of that whole experience of what that's like to have to really do a big film project like that in a historic house museum. Obviously they did that six times over for you all <laughs> for each, you know, yes. six different buildings. Um, and, you know, Melanie, I know we were talking about the idea of lighting and the concerns that you have with a historic home of making sure that it's going to look right, but also that it's going to be safe for the structure. Melanie, you were saying in the past when you've had filming, you're wandering around trying to make sure it's not getting too hot um, in the in the set. <laughs> yeah, we heard um, Howard talk about the LED lights and how that sort of changed things. And I was thinking that would make such a difference because yes, I was following people around measuring light activity and, and temperature. And um, I don't know, Trudy, it's it's terrifying to me to think of a film crew coming in and taking over uh, our historic house. So I am so curious to hear about how things were moved and um, sort of who was on, on scene to protect things and what you were doing prior to the film crew coming in. Well, yeah, I think that all of us have the same reaction, those of us who are in this field, this business, and you get a call from Hollywood and you're supposed to be excited about that, but the first <laughs> reaction is, oh my God, no. <laughs> um, because we're we're very protective of our collections, as you all know. Um, I have to give great credit to HBO and to the producers of The Gilded Age because they uh, really got our jobs well. Um, they allowed our conservators and our curatorial staff and our special events staff to be on site and to do all the moving that needed to be done during the production. There were never any quibbles about that. Uh, we had a phenomenal time, and I, I really credit them. Uh, there were no disturbances or things not treated well. They were as respectful of our furniture and as our objects as are we, and that is really nice. Um, so our people were there much of the time, all the way to the end of the show at 11 o'clock at night, um, and, and it was understood that our people were moving things. And it was not a problem. And uh, it was great to work with HBO. And we know now we are getting a season two of The Gilded Age that has been announced. And you were saying that you're sort of in some early talks about what that might look like for you guys. So we may, we're probably going to see more of Newport in season two of The Gilded Age. Hopefully, physically, you know, actually the characters doing some Newport things, summering in Newport, but obviously also the sets as well. That's right. We are talking to HBO right now, which is great. Uh, we're all on pins and needles about whether episode, uh, season two would be renewed, and it was, which is great. Uh, and I think we will see the production team back in Newport for the spring. And they are actually looking at other of our houses and determining whether some of them might be used for future filming. So we'll see. Okay, so more than just the ones we've already seen, maybe there will be some new some new sets as well. That's really exciting. Well, does that have sorry? Yeah, go ahead, Melanie. Does that have an effect on your sort of regular visitorship and um, oh, yeah. when you're open to the public? I'm curious about that. Well, um, you know, last year twenty, uh, we were very fortunate because filming was being done in the winter time, and we have in the winter very few houses. We have eleven historic houses. They range from the Hunter House, which is where Marion learned about her father and that there was no money left in the family um, to uh, the Elms and, and um, Marble House, the, the bigger houses. So uh, we were very fortunate in that the timing for the first season was done in the wintertime. And I think that's going to play itself out too for this um, winter into spring. Uh, we will open up uh, all of our houses starting really in May. Um, some of our houses are open actually right now. We've got Marble House and the Breakers open. Um, so we've been able to move things around and they've been very respectful of the fact that we're trying to get a schedule out. We've got to let the world know when they can come and visit. This is a popular destination. People buy well in advance. It's a place that fills up quickly. So they've been very respectful of that. Great. That's fantastic. And the one thing that I meant to tell you is that uh, in certain cases, for example, at, Ch at Chateau sur Mer, we had to completely empty out certain rooms for filming purposes. So they were only capturing the what was on the walls and the decorative elements. Um, and, and so that was 
in terms of manpower issues, that was a really big project for us to not only dismantle a room, but then to put it back together again um, after the filming was done. And these are big productions. I don't know if Howard talked about this for Lindhurst, but huge tents were put up. Um, there were mess halls for all of the actors, the stagehands, everybody involved. There were kitchens. Uh, there was in Newport um, testing. There was a, almost a, I'd say a nurse's office, if you will. Um, there is a whole tent set aside for people to change their clothes. So it, it really was a huge production. Yeah, really, I imagine it just sort of takes over the whole town, it essentially. It, it does, it really does, yeah. <laughs> well, that's so cool. I'm so, you know, thank you so much for sort of filling that in because I think that's something that is hard to appreciate if you're just watching the show, not realizing that these are real historic homes. Quite a, quite a few of the sets are real historic homes and sort of the special considerations that have to go into filming in a place like that. It's not And just Kelsey, I think um, you, you learn to, to appreciate Hollywood because I have, to, I have to admit that I was somewhat shocked and wondered how did this get by us when I saw a fire in the fireplace oh. in, <laughs> and, and then realized that no, I think somebody played a little bit with that one. Yeah, there's some we CGI. Didn't, we didn't <laughs> allow any, we didn't allow any, but you know, th th that was the billiards room. That was where Mr. Russell was meeting um, with, I'm sorry, uh, it was Morrison, I think yeah, it was. Yeah, Mr. Morris, yeah. That was the big business deal going on. Right. And it, they did use the um, billiard table, mm -hmm. but they allowed us to cover it over completely so that there was no damage done to it at all. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I think Lind, uh, Lindhurst had a similar situation in their dining room because they didn't really have the option to move their dining table out. And so they used their dining table. They protected it the best that they can, they could, you know, covered it up. But the actors are sitting at their dining room table, uh, you yeah. know, acting, which is such an interesting thing. Um, let's turn our, our attention a little bit to Gladys. Gladys is a big part of this episode. Um, we talked a little bit in episode four of the after show about this conversation around Gladys coming out to society. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that and the fact that she hasn't made her debut yet. It seems like she's maybe getting a little closer to that with each episode. Um, but the big sort of plot point of this episode is that Gladys has found herself a little bit of a love match in Archie Baldwin, and she's hoping to, you know, get approval from George and Bertha. She doesn't ultimately get that approval. You know, Bertha feels like she can find her something better. We don't know what better actually is. Um, but Trudy, I know you were saying that you've seen some really striking similarities, and I know other people out on the internet have seen these similarities as well, between Gladys's storyline with sort of her marriage prospects and the very real experiences of Consuelo Vanderbilt, who had a very similar situation. Can you tell viewers a little bit about what Consuelo went through? <laughs> yeah, it's such a, such a great story because Consuelo herself had a, a, a beau. She was madly in love with him, Winthrop Rutherford. Her mother did not approve of him at all, though he came from a decent family, but not quite the A-list in terms of Alva Vanderbilt's view. And Alva Vanderbilt actually, in order to cement the reputation of the Vanderbilt family and to elevate its prominence within the high circles, her ambition was to get Consuelo married off to English nobility. And she found the right person in the Duke of Marlborough and uh, Blenheim Palace, which many of your viewers I'm sure have visited in um, England, uh, was in really bad shape. And the agreement was that the uh, Vanderbilt family would pay for the, uh, up, uh, the restoration of Blenheim in return for providing uh, to Consuelo, the Duchess of Marlborough title. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't go over well with Consuelo, nor did it go over with the Duke of Marlborough, but their marriage lasted for 20 plus years and it was finally annulled. They were both Catholic, and they had children, but the marriage was annulled um, because uh, they wanted to go on and marry again. It was a really, um, it just must have been a hard experience. And I see Gladys heading in the same direction. Um, her mother just 
it wasn't a decision for Consuelo at all. Her mother was going to make that decision and it was out of her hands completely. And we see that playing out in yeah, the Gilded there, I think very early viewers sort of recognized immediately that there is a lot of Alva Vanderbilt in Bertha. There are a lot of similarities with her. Um, and so I think we're seeing that again, sort of play out even between Gladys and Bertha, sort of this tension of Bertha sort of trying to tell Gladys, just trust me, I'm, yeah, I know what I'm doing, but of course that doesn't help poor Gladys, who's a little heartbroken. And we see, you know, Archie Baldwin, I think, is sort of fills that, that, that role of Consuelo's sort of first bow of being in society. He's technically in that, that class, but he's just not quite right. Um, we hear Gladys sort of tell George and Bertha that the Baldwin family, you know, they have a house on Fifth Avenue. They are building a house in Newport. In Newport. And she <laughs> thinks that's going to be enough to sort of, you know, ingratiate him in, but it isn't. Um, and this idea of Consuelo Vanderbilt being married off to uh, European aristocracy, she's not the only one that has that situation in this period, so much so that there is a phrase that is assigned to these women, and they're called dollar princesses. That's a phrase that many people will be familiar with. Um, and Melanie, I know you in particular have done a lot of reading about dollar princesses, and I, I want to take a look at an illustration that we have, um, which is really sort of indicative, I think, of what this whole thing was about. <laughs> yes, uh, found this illustration on the Library of Congress website, um, the European Svengali and the Tribbles of the 400. Uh, he hypnotizes <laughs> them every time. So all of these <laughs> ladies of the 400 who we'll talk about with Lord McAllister too, um, sort of bowing down to this, you know, not handsome prince from Europe. Um, he's got I don't know if you can see it, but he's got all kinds of bills coming out of his pockets. He's coming to America to sort of secure the fortune yeah. to just like um, we were talking about sort of upkeep the palaces and, and their things over there. They're looking for that fortune and that new money to sort of build up what they've got going on. And the women are looking for the title to bring them up in society and give them a little bit of a name and, and elevate them in American society. And we saw that. Um, a little bit with Cora Crawley too. So Julian Fellows is also very aware of this and I think tying in with that. And I've heard, I've heard rumor that we will hear or we will see a little bit of crossover maybe with Downton Abbey, some uh, characters getting a little bit of a preview of what came from Downton Abbey or, or a prologue. So yeah. um, I think, I think we all see where Gladys is headed. And I felt bad because Archie is not, he's not a bad prospect either with, no. <laughs> with George Russell sort of able to get him in with the Seligman brothers, you know, he has the power to get him a job to secure some additional wealth. He could have been a good match for Gladys. So I'm feeling, feeling so bad for poor Gladys. I do, I do want to interject here. I don't know if you've ever, um, there's a great book about Alva and her daughter and the thesis of that is, is actually very feminist in that the view some argue that Alva had was that you could have far more flexibility as a duchess in England that you, than you would ever have as the wife of a millionaire or multimillionaire in New York and that you shouldn't punish her too much for being so dictatorial that what she was providing to her daughter, this is the argument, was uh, opportunities that Consuelo would not have had here at that period of time. And if you look at the uh, trajectory of Consuelo as the Duchess, she was very active in that whole region of England and she was doing events every day and opening up orphanages and volunteering to be at lots of things. So it, it was, it, there was an argument in Alva's mind that would say, it wasn't just about elevating the stature of our family, but also providing to my daughter an opportunity that she wouldn't get here. Yeah. I think that's such an interesting idea because we've, we've talked about that even within a little bit of the context of the show that there's not a ton of 
options for women in this period. There, there's a growing number of options for women in, in the Gilded Age. And certainly as we approach the turn of the century, that becomes true. But for women like Consuelo or, you know, Gladys, the fictionalized version, um, you know, having a space in society to make their mark and to, you know, whether that's being involved in charity or whatever else, that was really the option that was available to them. So that's interesting, you know, this idea that Alva is being strategic about it from a lot of perspectives, but because she wants Alva to be able to be in a position to make her mark, to make an impact. Um, and she believes that European aristocracy is the best place that she can do that. That's really interesting. It does feel as if Lord Fellows is raising all of these good questions about women's autonomy in this era. And once again, Peggy's position, perhaps surprisingly, yeah. seems enviable. Mm. Yeah. Um, she's the career woman in the group and probably the most mm. highly educated from a conventional sense. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, we know that she does have sort of higher level education. She mentions that, and Peggy mentions that sort of briefly in the first episode. Um, and yeah, so for all of the challenges that Peggy has because of her race and because of, you know, just her, the fact that she's sort of an outsider in this Fifth Avenue society. Yeah, she does. She has a freedom that someone like Gladys doesn't have. Um, and yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, there's all these dynamic with female characters in this show who sort of represent different levels of, of the female experience in the Gilded Age from different perspectives, which I find so interesting. It really is a female driven cast, I think, more than anything. Absolutely. And, and I, I think I it's just, such an interesting period of history because um, Alva, who forces her daughter into a marriage that the daughter did not want, then is one of the first women in society to have a divorce in the 1890s. And it was scandalous. She was just rejected. Nobody wanted her near. Um, and then she went on to become one of the country's foremost suffragettes, suffragists, whichever way you want to go, English or, or American. Um, and she she put so much of her money and her time and her creativity into securing for women the right to vote. So she went from, whoa, 180 degree change. And then at the court hearing for her daughter's um, divorce, not her divorce, the annulment, mm -hmm. she said to the judge, I am guilty. I am the person who forced my daughter to marry the Duke of Marlborough. So do not make her the victim here. I am the person who should be chastised. So I, I just think it's such an interesting time for women in history at all levels, for yeah. Peggy and for Consuelo and, and for Alva and for Mrs. Russell and yeah. for Clara Barton and her yes. and mm -hmm. advocacy and, and how all these women gather around and are so impressed by her. It's just, it's a really fun time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he's doing a great job in bringing it to light. And the fact that he introduced Peggy into the script, this is Lord Fellows, is, is just remarkable because uh, I, I don't know that many Americans know Gilded Age history well. Well, we know that they don't because this is what we do. They don't know Gilded Age history. And the fact that, and people don't know that as within 20 years of the Civil War, um, African-Americans were succeeding exceedingly well. Mm. We don't yeah. know that. We yeah. don't acknowledge it. So the fact that he's making that part of the storyline, I think is really important for our overall understanding of this part of American history. Absolutely. Yeah. I think and, we were worried yeah. in the first episode, we were worried about how quickly Peggy was introduced and how maybe a little contrived that felt and what was going to happen if we were going to get an authentic vision and sort of a full life of, of what Peggy was experiencing or if she was just going to be sort of a concierge to racism to remind us that it's still there in New York. But I've been so happy to see her story develop the way it has and knowing the historians that are working behind the scenes to make those authentic, real connections and, and drive that storyline. Yeah, absolutely. I'm reflecting more on that too, Melanie. And now I've come to realize that part of that opening scene, I think was inviting the audience to question our own preconception, mm. pre preconceptions. At the yeah. moment she offered to pay for the train ticket. I thought, you can't afford that. You shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> We're making you into some kind of a saint. And only later would we find out she had plenty of money. <laughs> 
she was in a position to behave charitably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's the thing about, you know, anybody who studies the Gilded Age long enough or any period of history, it's a complicated and messy thing. Um, you know, um, human history is not easily broken down into very, you know, digestible um, categories. And, and so, you know, there are complications, there are contradictions. And I think um, he's doing a fantastic job of showing sort of the wide variety of human experiences in this period. Sure, Fifth Avenue is very much the sort of center of the story, but slowly with each episode, we're seeing that that world build out. We see a little bit of a tenement in episode five, which I hope that we'll explore a little bit more to sort of see how, you know, other people are living in New York. So it's, it's, it's all building on itself. And I think that's really fascinating. Before we move on, though, I know that Lizzie in particular would like to talk about Gladys's <laughs> hair. And I know you have a particular <laughs> grievance with her hair that I think we all agree with you, but I would like you to share what your feelings are about Gladys's <laughs> hairstyle. <laughs> I want to be sporting and recognize the fact that this is a drama and not a documentary, but this really struck me as I was looking at your wonderful print, Melanie, of the dollar princesses <laughs> kneeling before the um, maestro. None of those young women were wearing a half ponytail. They didn't have beach waves. <laughs> women in the Gilded Age wore their hair in elaborate updos, but it wasn't loose. And my sense is that probably the dressers for this particular drama are trying to make very clear to us the extent to which Gladys is being infantilized. She looks like a child with her, her ahistorical hair that's only a teeny bit pulled up, but most of it's still loose, almost as a person in their 20s would wear it today. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that for historians of this era, we notice. <laughs> and we now let's add to our list of all-time favorites of yeah. ahistorical hair and makeup, which is its <laughs> own future podcast. <laughs> now that she has a proper, a proper lady's maid, maybe we'll get some better Gladys hairstyles here. And she'll get some help. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering if, if we do, which I think we probably will, get to see her debut to society in this season. I'm wondering if that's, you know, when she walks into the debut, maybe her hair will be pulled back <laughs> and that will be the signal that she has fully come out as a as a grown woman the hairstyle is now for a grown woman um but yeah those are the like the little details that you that you notice that are I think for Hollywood they're telling a story with her hairstyle maybe um but yeah you definitely it it's it's very stark in comparison to the way the other women are doing their hair in the period um we're going to shift gears just a little bit. We are going to talk about Clara Barton, absolutely, but we also want to talk a little bit about Ward McAllister. Um, <laughs> he is mentioned in the in episode four, sort of as this uh, looming presence. He's sort of um, put, he's sort of offered up to Bertha as sort of an opportunity for her to finally get her foot in the door, and so we finally get to see that interaction in episode five. And Ward McAllister, like many of the characters in the Gilded Age, is a real was a real person. He's one of those real characters, but he's a fascinating figure in New York high society and sort of within this story that we're seeing play out. And Melanie, I know you've done a little bit of extra research about Ward McAllister and sort of who he really was. So I'm hoping you can sort of fill in for some viewers who was the real Ward McAllister and what are we seeing in terms of Nathan Lane's portrayal of him? So Ward McAllister was sort of a professional snob. He found his way to finding a way to do it that was um, appreciated by society. He found a place. He was, uh, he was Southern. We were all maybe a little surprised by the accent coming out of Nathan Lane. So that's been really fun, but he was trained as an attorney in Savannah, Georgia, and his family, I think his brother was the first one who went west during the gold rush and sent back notice that he had hit something. And uh, Ward McAllister and his father went out and they made a fortune um, sort of in the gold rush. And then Ward McAllister also marries an heiress um, who is mostly absent in his life, which provides him with the opportunity to be an escort for what is Carolyn Astor. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sort of helping her form the New York elite, establishing 25 patriarchs who are the leaders of society and through them establishing the famous 400, um, which was never actually exactly 400 and was not, as I understand, 
really related to the size of the Astor ballroom, but um, maybe coincidentally, 400 people fit well in the ballroom. Um, <laughs> so it's been interesting to see him and we'll, I think we'll learn a little bit more about him and what happens to him over the years through the 1890s. Um, so I don't want to give away any spoilers, but I guess, suppose yes. you can Google him if you're dying to know what happens to him after. Yeah, absolutely. And he's sort of that there's a line where Nathan Lane sort of, you know, or maybe it's not Nathan Lane, but somebody refers to him as sort of the gatekeeper um, to Mrs. Astor. And that's a very real thing. He sort of self-positioned himself to be that for Caroline Astor. Um, but, you know, he he was the one that was basically saying, you're in, you're out. <laughs> um, you, they, you, refer, you hear in the episode them refer to Mrs. Astor and Ward McAllister is like the king and queen of Newport. Um, and so he was certainly spending a lot of time up in Newport as well. Um, and Trudy, I understand he had a home in Newport. It's his home right. is not part of your guys' you know, historic right. site, but it did exist. And going back to the 1850s. So he had a presence in Newport that was legitimate. He wasn't at the last minute, but he had been around yeah. new people there. Yeah. So in Newport, I, we call people like, uh, I don't know if this is an expression in Pittsburgh, but we call people like Ward McAllister walkers. Do you use that term? No, I'm not familiar. He was a, he was a yeah. walker. He was a person who um, accompanied a, a, a woman to, and made sure that she was escorted to the parties. And so those single men out there who are charming and funny and all the things that he was, and he was up on all the gossip and he could fill you in on all the latest trends and he had all of the great styles down and he knew how to entertain uh, you know everybody needs a walker in their life <laughs> <laughs> and it seems i mean he seems like he's sort of positioning himself to be Bertha's walker a little bit yes. I mean, he, the, we're seeing like a really fun sort of repartee between the two of them I am kind of excited to see more of Nathan Lane and Carrie Coon <laughs> as those characters <laughs> together um but we see that in that luncheon um him sort of dangling it in front of Bertha that he can help her get where she wants to go um and she seems you know fully excited to take advantage of that so I'm excited to see sort of how that plays out and speaking of Bertha, you know, I think what's striking in this episode is we really see her make progress on her endeavors in this episode in particular, um, whether it's the luncheon, you know, with Ward McAllister or the trip to Dansville, it, which is a huge part of the episode, you know, them making this trek out to Dansville to see um, Clara Barton speak, which is um, an important plot point. Dansville, New York was the actual location of Clara Barton's first chapter of the American Red Cross. Um, and the fact that Bertha's even invited to go on this trip is sort of a huge win for her. And then she has her moment <laughs> in that moment where she gets invited up on stage by Clara Barton to sort of get her accolades for her for her money. And she has that win moment. And of course, then it's it's um sort of juxtaposed with Mrs. Morris being there and being so incredibly to a rightful extent, bitter towards uh, bitter towards Bertha. But um, we had talked a little bit about Clara Barton and that scene in the dining room where she really makes it clear that she doesn't care about any of this society nonsense. <laughs> All she cares about is her work. And I think it's worth talking a little bit about what that work was because um, it's all very real, obviously. Clara Barton was a real person. Um, and these early days of the American Red Cross were really foundational to what is now the American Red Cross. Um, Melanie, I know you've done some research about some of the early things that the American Red Cross were doing in the U.S. and one of them that has a Pittsburgh tie. Yeah, I was really enjoying kind of looking back at Clara Barton and learning about her career, her very early sort of academic success as a young woman, um, and then going on to be a teacher and then getting uh, a clerkship in D.C. in the patent office, one of the first or the first woman who was also paid equally to men. So she had a fabulous career of her own and just such a fascinating woman talking about women who can make their own way and have advocacy for themselves and um, sort of cut a path for their own life and throwing off society's expectations of what a woman was meant to do in this time period. Um, and then deciding to go out into the fields during the Civil War and sort of um, work with the soldiers and, and help them and gather supplies and 
reach out to women in society and say, your boys need you on the front, um, you know, knit scarves, send blankets, we need supplies, all the while, while the US government is saying, no, we're good, we've got people, don't worry, everything is fine. Um, so she's really raising support for them. And then as a break, she goes to Europe and she's traveling and she gets involved with the International Red Cross because she really is a woman who can't take a real break. She can't take a vacation. So she gets involved with them and eventually comes back to the U.S. and says, like, OK, I will start working on establishing a U.S. chapter. Um, and so we see her sort of raising money with society, getting women involved, which is really interesting, just giving women a cause and a charity that they can sort of take on as their own, as their own mission. Um, and then after establishing um, a, few, a few chapters in 1889, one of the first natural disasters that the Red Cross really gets to show what they can do is the Johnstown flood. So a Frick connection, a Pittsburgh connection, and really interesting to think of, of that being weaved in through this show. And we'll probably Melanie and Kelsey, is, I, am I remembering this correctly, but wasn't it Mr. Russell who, after learning about this incident, this accident, said, make sure we call the Red Cross? Did, didn't somebody in the show say that? Yeah, there's a moment at the end, that very last scene where we, we yeah. find out that there's been a significant train wreck um, accident on one of the Russell lines. And one of the first things that, yeah, George, I believe, says to Bertha, mm -hmm. in fact, or Mr. Clay, his secretary, you know, saying, well, let's reach out to Clara Barton at the Red Cross and see what they can do. Um, and yeah, I think that's, you know, so telling about yeah. obviously the importance of the Red Cross, but um, also, you know, it's very fortuitous that Bertha has made this connection with Clara Barton at this point, um, and they can sort of call on that. And so I hope we get to see a little bit of what that looks like, you know, what we, I hope we get to see what it looks like when Clara Barton is in response mode and what she does to sort of help mm. um, with this, with this train wreck, um, because that's exactly what she intended it to, to be, you know, the Red Cross is not just a wartime thing that's sort of where it started but she really envisioned it as being a humanitarian response to all sorts of human disasters natural disasters and things like that and you know we see that in the episode when they visit the ward and she talks about the burn victims um i thought that was an interesting tie one of the very first in addition to the johnstown flood one of the very first responses that the u.s red cross does is to a huge forest fire in michigan um they respond to that um it's called the thumb fire um and so yeah she's she's really stepping into something that didn't exist it wasn't it was there was a vacuum of this this didn't exist um and the american red cross is still around today it's still it's still doing that work which is really amazing that it's you know founded by a woman a really strong woman who had knew exactly what she wanted to do and <laughs> she created a legacy her for herself that still and exists she didn't and still care who us. was in or out did she yeah she didn't not care at all. one bit nope <laughs> <laughs> Cash Just give the me check. the money and I'll do what I need to do and that's the yeah. cause yeah well, she's not interested in the politics of it at all you know mm -hmm. and she really says that at that dinner you know she says she is happy to take Bertha's money she's happy to take Mrs. Chamberlain's money you know she doesn't care for any of the politics she's kind of, she sort of has this air of you know go ahead and play your politics you guys do what you're going to do I don't really care I'm not going to be involved with it just help me however you can. I have, she's rising above a little bit because she has bigger goals that are more than just high society, which I love. But how fortuitous of the Russells to yeah. know that if they invested their money with the Red Cross, um, they wouldn't get rebuffed, that mm. there was a real opportunity for them to make some mm -hmm. steps forward and they did. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they, there's a line at the end of the episode where George says that how, however this train accident sort of plays out, it has the potential to ruin them and to ruin their business. Um, so I imagine what we're going to see is the Russell sort of going into a mode where they're sort of 
working very carefully to see how this plays out and to ensure that it doesn't ruin their business. And if they're able to throw their weight behind the Red Cross and bring the Red Cross in to help with it, that might help with their image a little bit, um, you know, in light of everything that's happened and the damage and the loss of life. So it's going to be interesting. I don't think we've seen the last of Clara um, in yeah. this in this show <laughs> at all. Trudy, when I saw that dinner scene with Clara acknowledging that she's aware of the politics, but intentionally stepping around it, I thought in many ways how little has changed for not-for-profit leaders oh, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the fundraising <laughs> business. <laughs> yeah, I was going to call that out a minute ago too, Lizzie, and then thought maybe I shouldn't, but our lives are really <laughs> no different. And uh, we, we have to tread very carefully, but we also have to have a view that um, you know, the mission for us, for you and for the Preservation Society is to take care of our houses and tell our stories and engage people in Gilded Age history and in our case, colonial history as well. And so whoever wants to help with that, we really welcome you. The mission has to come first. <laughs> Well, we kind of thought we can wrap up with a follower, an Instagram follower question. Um, we had a, a question on Instagram um, from, let me make sure I make the, I get this username right, from Hey Hi Guys, um, that is their username. Um, and they ask, um, how much education would Marion be likely to have? Um, which is a great question. And we can't, you know, based on what we know about her and her background, I think we can sort of safely um, make some, some guesses um, about what that probably looked like. Um, we know she's well-to-do. Obviously her, her father sort of squanders that money towards the end of his life, but um, you know, she comes from generational wealth. Her, her family through, you know, Agnes and Ada's family has money. Um, so it's safe to assume, I think, that she would be pretty well educated. Most well-to-do young girls were. Um, the Gilded Age is really interesting when you look at the progression of education. Um, it's really into the 1880s, 1890s that we start to see the formation of what we would probably consider modern education in terms of public schooling, high schools, um, higher education, like colleges and universities. Um, so that's all sort of forming in this period. Um, but education in the early Gilded Age in particular is very differentiate differentiated along gender lines so the fact that Marion is a woman she probably would have been educated mostly in her home I think because she also grew up in more of a rural setting that's probably particularly true um, so she would have probably received you know the typical stuff reading writing basic math but she also would have probably learned some of the more gender specific things that she would have been expected to do as a future wife and mother she would have learned to be a hostess she would have learned to you know do meal planning and, and things like that. Um, whereas a young boy, he probably would also be, you know, uh, educated in the home at least early on, but would be much more likely to then go out into the world um, and get further education. So um, especially if he was going to do on the job training, like becoming a doctor or a lawyer or something that would require specifics like that. Um, I was thinking Melanie and Lizzie uh, Mr. Frick is sort of a good example of that. Um, he's a little bit earlier, obviously, but he didn't really receive a very long formal education. He spent a lot of his time, though, in his adolescence and his young adult years learning from his grandfather, doing sort of that on-the-job training. Um, so it really varies along class and regional lines what education looks like in the Gilded Age, but I think that's sort of a safe assumption to make about, about Marion. Um, I don't know, you know, Melanie or Lizzie or Trudy, if you had any other, you know, thoughts about what that might have looked well, like. I'm thinking about Consuelo and her education was very much at home, as you mentioned, um, and, and she was being trained. Um, she, she actually grew up in France because the family left the South where the Civil War was raging uh, to avoid all of the war. And so she, she was trained in everything from, uh, she spoke French beautifully. In fact, she became a real Francophile, as was her mother, Alba. So she had a very broad education, but it was all at home. And they must have been spending an awful lot of money to bring in high quality tutors of yeah. the kind that she was training under. Yeah. And I, I don't know if Marion's family had that much, but I agree with you that I'm sure she was well-educated and probably at home. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and we know, you know, Helen has a very similar, Helen Frick has a very similar sort of um, trajectory. You know, she has a governess who is also her, her tutor, um, who, you know, sort of in charge of her education, but that happens at home. Um, Helen Clay Frick had a little schoolroom up in the upper floors of Clayton where she did her sort of studies, whereas her brother Childs was educated outside of the house as well. He went to schools in the neighborhood. He eventually goes off to boarding school. Um, so that's sort of more specific to that. But yeah, there, you know, it's hard to say with Marion because she's not quite necessarily up to the, the class of say the Fricks or certainly the Vanderbilts. But um, I think it's a, a safe assumption to kind of make about her about her education. But um, thank you so much for the question. Um, we love answering these, these follower questions. Um, and so we'll wrap up with our, our typical um, thing where this is where I say you can always follow us uh, the Frick on Instagram at Frick PGH if you have not already subscribed to the Frick's YouTube channel you can do that now so that you don't ever miss an episode of the unofficial Gilded Age after show you can also, of course, find the Newport Mansions online at newportmansions.org. Um, like I said, I will continue to plug their wonderful website. They have fantastic virtual tours. So if you are not able to get out to Newport to see these places in person, um, that will at least give you the sense of really the grand scale of everything <laughs> that you all have going on out there. Um, but of course, I want to thank you know Lizzie and Melanie for taking time. And of course, I want to thank Trudy for taking time out of your day. It's been so wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. This is a great show. Thank you so much. Thank We're so you. glad to be doing it. We're having a lot of fun. Um, so we will, of course, be back next week for episode six. We are officially over the halfway point um, of the season. So we will see how things continue to progress. Um, but thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time.